Salutations, and welcome to another installment of my beta analysis series. We're analyzing something quite different this time around, as this will technically be the first non-Halo development build that I cover on the channel. This is the prototype of 2007's Shadowrun game. Those of you who are around during the days of the Halo 3 beta, you might remember this game being advertised in the main menu after the Halo 3 beta concluded. Shadowrun is a multiplayer-only first-person shooter that is essentially a fantastical rendition of Counter-Strike. At the start of each match, you're given a set amount of in-game currency which can use to buy weapons, magic abilities, and tech abilities, and the better you perform in a match, the more currency you earn for the next round. Magic and tech abilities cost essence to use, which is essentially this game's rendition of mana, and it's up to the player to carefully manage their mana resources to get the most out of their abilities. Players choose between four races, which are the humans, elves, trolls, and dwarves. Each race provides a handful of positive and negative attributes that conform to whatever playstyle you prefer. The objectives of each match revolve around a MacGuffin simply called the Artifact. The three game modes present in Shadowrun all involve the Artifact in some way. Raid is basically one flag capture the flag. One team defends the Artifact while the other team tries to take it. Extraction is a neutral flag rendition of Raid where both teams fight over the Artifact. Lastly, Attrition is a pure elimination game mode but holding onto the artifact will place waypoints on all of the enemy players, but enemies in turn will be able to see who holds the artifact. All of this sounds tacky, but I have to admit that it was pretty fun gathering footage for this video. The gunplay is solid and skill focused, and the magic and tech powers are really fun to use. Say what you want about the final game, but I feel if they had released this game at a price tag that was typical for an Xbox arcade game, and enabled Windows XP users to boot the game from the start, Shadowrun would have been a much more fondly remembered video game. Now, I did say this was technically going to be my first non-Halo video, but there's a bit of a catch. The prototype runs on a modified fork of Halo Combat Evolve's engine. In an Inside Bungie article, where Frank O'Connor had an interview with some of the members of Fossa Studios, which were the developers who worked on the game, it was stated that while the game was prototyped on the CE engine, the final game ran on its own in-house engine, which was called Badger. Using the tried-and-true Halo engine allowed Fossa Studios to formulate and polish their gameplay mechanics while the Badger engine was still in development. Before we start this video, I'd like to announce I'm going to be utilizing the VKMT YouTube channel more for the foreseeable future. There, I'll be posting no commentary content on our modding projects, such as gameplay previews, trailers, etc. In fact, we have our 8th anniversary mod showcase event happening on April 17th, which also happens to be my birthday by the way. Projects such as Halo 2 Uncut, Halo CE Plus, and more will be shown off there, so subscribe to our VKMT channel to stay tuned for what's to come. With introductions out of the way, let's begin. Unlike my past pre-release analyses, I won't compare and contrast the elements such as the maps, UI, and game modes. Unlike the finished product which has 9 available multiplayer maps and lacks a single player campaign, the Shadowrun prototype only consists of a single test level that runs like a Halo 1 campaign map. When the executable is ran, the build is scripted to automatically boot the test map and display a frame rate counter on the bottom right. But before we continue on, I'd like to exit the level and head on over to the build's main menu. It uses its own art background in place of CEs. I'm not really sure where this background is from though. Leave a comment if you happen to know if this was used anywhere else. The majority of the menu itself matches CEs, but the multiplayer option in this build has a handful of differences. There are pictures of some custom maps that have the Shadowrun logo slapped onto the preview images, but none of them will boot as the build doesn't include any multiplayer map files. Damnation is replaced by Midtown. Derelict is replaced by Dig Site. Boarding Action is replaced by Subway. And Logist is replaced by Warehouse. Of the four maps, Dig Site is the only one that has a presence in the final game, and is likely one of the first multiplayer maps developed by Fossa Studios for Shadowrun. I say this because on Unseen64's page for Shadowrun, there's two images of a blockout rendition of Dig Site running in Halo CE's engine, much like our prototype build. I'm a bit uncertain about the other three maps regarding where they fit in the final game, if they even appear in some form at all. The game types are mostly the same as those seen in Halo 1, but the one exclusive game mode present is Shadowrun. What it's meant to do when booted in multiplayer is unknown, and was likely just a test mode. In the campaign level selection screen, there are three custom level entries that replace the first three missions of the Halo 1 campaign. However, only the first level, the Artifact, is selectable as it was the only map file included in the build. 
The test level itself is a short mission that aimed to experiment with many of Shadowrun's game mechanics. Upon booting up the level, you start with an assault rifle as your primary and a katana, which switches your point of view to third person, as your secondary. Holding down the B button, the ability menu appears, and the player can choose between magic or tech abilities to equip to your loadout. The abilities that are available to you at the start of the mission include teleport, which is the sole magic ability that can be chosen, as well as four tech abilities. These are grenades, anti-magic grenades, hologram, and enhanced vision. The two columns that appear on the screen represent essence and health, with essence on the left and health on the right. Something noteworthy about the button pops on screen is the fact that it's designed for an Xbox 360 controller, since the RB and LB buttons are present. However, the prototype is on the original Xbox, which doesn't have bumpers, so the white button is used for LB, and the black button is for RB. Our player character is a human soldier, but the neat thing about the biped is that it's a Halo Marine with the armor lights from the Mark V Spartan armor attached to it. As we start progressing through the tunnel, we encounter enemy human soldiers, who use the Halo 1 Marines as a placeholder design. Shadowrun utilizes an accuracy penalty system with all of its weapons. When moving and jumping, your weapon's spread will expand. This part of the mission allows the player to get used to the shooting mechanics, as well as to coax players to equip and use the teleport ability. Teleport will shoot you a few meters in the direction your body is moving. For example, if you jump and immediately use teleport, since your body is moving upwards, you'll be shot upwards. Or if you're walking forward, you'll shoot forward. Enhanced vision marks everyone within 60 meters with either friendly or enemy waypoints, and hologram will spawn a holographic decoy of yourself. However, unlike Halo Reach's hologram, for example, where it spawns an exact copy of yourself and stands in place once it reaches its destination, the Shadowrun prototype's hologram will always hold an assault rifle regardless of what weapon you have out, and it has actual AI and will engage enemies, but it won't dish out any damage. On the top platform, we're introduced to a new weapon, simply called the Rifle. It's a designated marksman weapon that's best suited for long-range combat, and works best when pacing shots. We're also introduced to a variant of the human soldier called the Commander. It uses the armored marine variant from Halo 1, but more importantly, it's the first enemy to use an ability, which in this case is Smart Link. The Commander doesn't flinch as easily as the other human soldiers, and uses a sporadic melee attack against the player when they get too close. Melee attacks are a notable subject when talking about Shadowrun, because it's not one of the standard ways for players to dish out damage. In the final game, the two ways you can access a melee attack is either when your weapon is out of ammo, or when you attempt to no-scope with a sniper rifle. However, neither of these conditions are present in this prototype, and because the magic and tech wheel is already mapped to the B button, Players don't have access to a melee attack at all, unless you count the katana. I'm going to go on a brief tangent for a moment and talk about your health. At the start of the video, I mentioned that the elves are the one race in Shadowrun that has access to health regeneration. However, your player character, which is a human, also has health regeneration. I'm not sure if this was an intentional plan for Shadowrun, such as elves having the fastest health regen out of the four races, or if it was just for testing purposes within the context of the prototype. We teleport into the next room when we face off against a new threat, a pair of trolls wielding miniguns. Whoever did these placeholder lines had a really good time, and I just love them. Trolls in Shadowrun are the toughest, but slowest moving races in the game. A passive perk they'd have is that when taking damage, spikes begin to protrude from their body, increasing their defensive stats. This is actually represented somewhat in the prototype. The trolls will scale up and change color when taking damage. Killing the trolls will give us access to their miniguns. It's a powerful weapon with a very long barrel spin time before it reaches its maximum fire rate. After the two trolls are killed, the elevator will take us down to a room with more human soldiers. The section after that is where we're introduced to grenades which the humans will start chucking at you. We can then equip the grenades from the tech menu and use them in future encounters. This room houses the artifact, which we're tasked to pick up. Upon doing so, we're granted a new magic ability, Resurrection. This ability revives dead players in the retail product, but in the prototype, corpses transform into flood combat forms. Obviously, Fossil Studios wasn't planning on having Bungie's Flood make an appearance in Shadowrun, but according to the map file scripts, it states that anyone revived by resurrection will turn them into zombies, with the Flood acting as stand-ins for them. After reviving the dead soldiers, 
The door explodes and more enemy humans show up to kill us. Only now, we have a squad of the undead as well as grenades at our disposal. We backtrack our way to the elevator room to witness one final encounter. A commander, some more human soldiers, and a troll guard the elevator. It's a tough fight, but every kill gives us the opportunity to gain a new ally via resurrection. When reviving the dead troll, we get a flood combat form with a troll mask on. Once everyone is killed, the final boss appears. An elf with a rocket launcher. The elf will use teleportation to get away from incoming fire, regenerate health when not taking any damage, and his rockets have a small amount of target tracking. Going up against his rockets are extremely annoying as the sound effect used for the AoE fire damage is infuriating to listen to. Upon dying, the elf summons a giant bear-like monster. Using the elite animations and dialogue as placeholders, the beast is a melee brawler that will dish out high amounts of damage with its claws. Killing it will turn it into a crewman. Alternatively, you can kill the elf with a headshot using the marksman rifle, and it won't be able to summon the beast. You can then use the resurrection ability on it, and the flood combat form will wear an elf mask. After killing the elf and his beast, we go up the elevator, notice the wall in front of us exploding, and out of nowhere, a pelican appears, signaling the end of the level. Internally, this pelican is referred to as a dragon. Perhaps, in the cut campaign, there's going to either be a dragon boss battle, or an allied dragon that serves as their means of evacuation like the pelican is. When doing my research on this prototype build and comparing it to the retail product, I was shocked with how well a lot of the gameplay mechanics that are present in the multiplayer game were translated in the Halo engine. I've gone over a couple of the weapons, abilities, and races that are present in both this prototype and the final game already, but I'd like to go a bit more in depth with each of them to showcase how they function between the two builds. Unlike my past Halo beta analyses, I won't be talking about some of the minor alterations such as damage values, rate of fire, etc and will instead focus on overall function. Considering this prototype is running on the Halo engine, a lot of the weapons, for example, use the stats from the Halo 1 counterparts and are likely not the intended values for the multiplayer game. Let's start with the Assault Rifle. The final game actually doesn't have a weapon called the Assault Rifle, but the one weapon that is the most synonymous to the prototype AR is the SMG, and it behaves pretty much just like it. It's a fast-firing weapon that blooms very quickly with sustained fire, and is one of the most consistent close-range options in the game. Meanwhile, the katana, rifle, minigun, and frag grenades are nearly one-for-one one with their retail cousins. As for the abilities, teleport and enhanced vision work very similarly to their final counterparts, and have already discussed the differences between the two renditions of Resurrection. However, hologram has no final game representation at all, and is a cut ability. While the amount of weapons and abilities that are usable in a normal playthrough of the prototype are limited, there are plenty that go unused within the map files. We can access the unused weapons using Halo's Cheat All Weapons command, but we can obtain the rest of the abilities by typing in Cheats Loadout 4 in the console. In order for us to get any of the anti-magic grenades, we'll additionally have to enable infinite ammo. We'll begin with the unused weapons, starting with the two pistols. I know I mentioned that I wouldn't be talking about the weapon stats like differing fire rates, but this will be the one exception. The first is simply called the Pistol, which uses the legendary M6D assets from Halo 1. In practice, it's the Halo 1 pistol that fires at a slower fire rate, uses the game's blue mechanics, and can't fire automatically when holding the trigger. The other pistol in the build is dubbed the Flechette Pistol. It sports a different model from the Halo 1 pistol, but it uses the Halo 1 pistol's textures which aren't properly applied to the weapon model. It is a fully automatic weapon that fires very weak flechette rounds from a 30 round magazine. Neither of these pistols behave like the one featured in Shadowrun. The pistol in the final build uses a similar model to the prototype flechette pistol and has a 12 round magazine like the Halo 1 pistol like weapon. However, the weapon doesn't fire flechette rounds anymore and its faster rate of fire and bloom values make this weapon perform better at closer ranges unlike the prototype pistol. Next is the sniper rifle. It's similar to its final game counterpart on a functional level, but with one notable exception. I've mentioned earlier that one of the only ways you could perform melee attacks in Shadowrun is when attempting to no-scope with a sniper rifle. However, this mechanic is not present in the prototype sniper, and the player can no-scope with a weapon, but the accuracy is terrible, and you don't even have a crosshair until you scope in. 
The other two unused weapons that actually have final game representations, which include the shotgun and rocket launcher, are nearly one for one with their retail cousins. There exists a second rocket launcher within this weapon palette. Eternally dubbed the Fireball, this is the variant used by the elf. The main differences include the target tracking feature, as well as the rocket sporting an effect that looks like the head of the beast the elf summons upon death. The player is unable to wield this weapon, but it's accessible when bump possessing an elf. Using this weapon as an elf reveals that it uses a charge up trigger behavior unlike the standard launcher. Lastly, there's the anti-magic grenades, which are renamed to anti-magic generators in the final game. Anyone caught within its area of effect will have their essence drained at a harsh rate. This can also be used to stop the elf's passive healing or the troll's defense boost when they get shot, but neither of these traits seem to work in the prototype. There is another unused weapon that does not appear in Shadowrun, the Razor Claws. It's another melee weapon that is mostly the same as the katana in practice. While both of these weapons force you into a third person perspective, it's possible to see them in first person. They both use the plasma rifle animations, and because our weapon tags use the plasma rifle's weapon tag as a base, the projectiles for the Covenant weapon are actually still present in the map data. There's also the Halo 1 energy sword that's missing its glowing effects, but I'll be talking more about this weapon a bit later. Next are the unused magic and tech abilities, and there are quite a few of them. Starting with the magic abilities, we have the Tree of Life. The user throws a seed that plants a magical tree that heals anyone within close proximity, and can be destroyed with gunfire. Strangle summons magic crystals that are used for area denial, draining health and essence from enemies that touch them. Like the Tree of Life, the crystals can be destroyed by shooting them or deploying anti-magic generators near them. Smoke transforms the player into a cloaked figure, protecting them from gunfire. However, while under the effects of smoke, the user can't use any of their other powers or weapons. In the prototype, it appears as if the user is meant to be active camouflaged, and while it seems as though it's not intentional for enemies to see a smoked player, this is actually on point with how the power works in Shadowrun. Enemies can still see you if you use smoke, they just can't hurt you or detect you with enhanced vision. Gust shoots out a powerful force of wind against opponents with considerable knockback. The last magic ability is Summon Elemental. In the prototype, the user is cloaked in fire, but nothing happens after that. I have two theories on what this was supposed to do. In the final game, the Summon ability allows the user to conjure a beastly minion that will attack any nearby enemies. Remember the elf encounter that summoned a large beast after dying? It's possible that this monster is supposed to be a stand-in for the summoned minion. Internally, the elf that spawns in this area is referred to as a shaman, and according to the Shadowrun franchise's wiki page, shamans are able to conjure various spirits, with one of these being a beastly spirit. In fact, the internal name for this monster is Spirit Animal. The other theory I have revolves around an unused active variant within the map files. There actually is an actor that was organized within an elemental folder, and it's an elite zealot that's on fire wielding an energy sword. This could either be an earlier version of the spirit animal, or it was supposed to be a placeholder test for a summoned minion that is closer to the size of the final game's minion. It's likely that the player was supposed to summon one of these elites when using summon elemental, but it wasn't set up in this build. Moving on, we now have the tech abilities. The first one I want to mention is Smart Link. This wasn't accessible to the player in the prototype without cheats, but it's used by the commander NPCs. Smart Link improves the user's auto-aim values at the permanent cost of some essence and a red laser shooting out of your visor that can alert enemies. Glider, as in the name, allows players to glide a short distance and prevents fall damage. The last unused tech ability is Grapple. When activated, the user is forced into third person and a hook extends until it hits a hard surface. The player is then shot forward until they reach the end of the rope. Like Hologram, it too doesn't have a final game representative and was cut before release. The one tech ability that appears in retail, but not in the prototype menu, is Wired Reflexes, and when it's equipped, it'll passively increase your movement and reload speeds as well as jump height. Using the ability manually will grant you a small speed boost, but you'll take some recoil damage. In the prototype, there actually is an unused effect tag for Wired Reflexes in the map files. Now I'll talk about each of the other races. The elves and trolls are depicted quite accurately when it comes to their gameplay mechanics outside of the health regeneration that everyone has, which should be exclusive to the elves. However, I mentioned earlier how Shadowrun has four races, but one of these 
the dwarf, didn't make an appearance in the prototype. The good news is there actually are unused dwarf assets within the build. Like his final game counterpart, the dwarf is able to sap essence from any and all bipeds that are within close proximity. The dwarf is even properly scaled in the prototype, as is his zombie form when resurrected. The zombie dwarf is even capable of sapping essence on top of this. There are two more game mechanics that I want to point out. One of these is bonded destruction. In the multiplayer game, after killing an enemy player, you can continue shooting their corpse until it disappears, and this prevents their allies from resurrecting them. This mechanic works in the prototype, although it doesn't do anything beneficial for the player since no enemies use resurrection. The other is different weapon weights. For those who have played Counter-Strike, you'll know all about this. The smaller the weapon, the lighter it is, and players will move faster with those than if they were to carry around a rocket launcher or a minigun. This too is represented well in the prototype. To wrap up this analysis, I'll be showcasing some of the more miscellaneous bits of trivia that can be found in the prototype. The developers experimented with different menu layouts for the game. Using the command Game Set Assignment Scheme, we can scroll through each of the configurations. The default assignment is number 6, but 0 through 5 have their differences. 0 utilizes a D-pad configuration, 1 uses a periodic table-like design, and 2 has the magic and tech abilities organized in columns. 3 through 5 use the standard wheel design, but have different quirks. Assignment 3 doesn't require the B button to be held when navigating the menu. Assignment 4 forces the buy menu to be opened with either left trigger, white, or black, and Assignment 5 will activate whichever ability is highlighted within the buy menu when you close it. For the last thing I'd like to showcase, I'm going to talk about the characters again. There's yet another unused character that I have no idea what it could have been used for. It's the Sentinels from Halo 1, but they use the assault rifle as a weapon instead of the Sentinel Beam. I honestly don't have a clue why it's here or what purpose it was meant to serve. It could have been prototyping a cut ability, perhaps something like Halo 4's Auto Sentry that spawns a flying drone, but I don't know for certain. And that's going to be it for this analysis. I hope you enjoyed what is technically my first non-Halo video. I get to do more of these in the future and expand my horizons, eventually covering games that have nothing to do with Halo at all. If, and only if, you enjoy this video, hit the like button, comment your thoughts on the video to appease that sweet algorithm, ring the bell to never miss an upload, and subscribe for more content from the Ventral Vatum. I also have a Patreon where you can voluntarily donate to further support the channel. I'd like to thank my Singhealy Zealots, as well as counselors John, Burley Martinez, Just Larm, Joshua Fisher, Andrea Victor, Tom Lean, Sean T, Jarrah Sunder, Conor Daytona, Lauren Kleckner, Joe Antonetti, Brad Mayan, Rosie Muscovy, and Kyle Dealman. This is the Ventral Vatum, and I'll see you on the great journey.